Good evening, and welcome to Wednesday night with Rooted Bible Fellowship Church. Tonight, we're going to look at a rebroadcasted message about the formula for prosperity, success, blessings, and favor for the believer. Please enjoy. Praise the Lord. We give honor to the true and living God on this Wednesday night Bible study. Truly, the Lord is worthy to be praised and truly Jesus is seated on the throne and we give his name honor, praise and glory on this Wednesday. Amen. What a great time to be a Christian. What a great time that the Lord has just blessed us in this season to represent his kingdom and his glory. Amen. And we're just thankful that the Lord has, has shown favor upon us and upholding us in his right hand. Amen. And I pray and trust that you've been doing well. We've been down for the last couple of Wednesdays, a little bit of admin, a little bit of vacation, but we're back ready to roll, get back into this word so we can grow up in the things of the Lord, look more like Jesus Christ. That's the call for the believer. The call for the believers is, is to be conformed into the image of Christ. And that's what we want to talk about. We want to grow up in the things of the Lord. And I want to encourage you as a believer, don't get caught up in this time so much that you get away from your word, get away from Bible study as believers. Um, if, you're, if you're a member here at Rooted, stay engaged in the things of the Lord. Stay engaged in the things that bring his name honor, praise, and glory. No matter what, stay on your knees, keep praying. Stay in Bible study, amen, stay in church, amen, and keep calling one another and, and um, provoking one another, encouraging one another, and uplifting one another, amen. We want to get in as we look at Wednesday night Bible study for September the 2nd, <clears throat> and before we talk about it, we want to talk about a new Bible study that we're going to begin next week. We're going to begin a brand new series, uh, a study series on Christian ethics. That's what we're going to begin next week, a brand new Bible study on Christian ethics. And what we're going to do is look at Christian ethics is the behavior of one's behavior. Ethics just means behavior. Amen. Christian ethics means our behavior as believers in this world. Amen. And so we're going to look at how to live in a world that has gone wrong. How do we who are believers live in a world that has gone wrong? How do we represent Jesus Christ? in this world that God has called us to. And, and we really want to spend time, put our foot on this and grow up in this. So there's a lot of questions that a lot of believers ask. Um, um, can I do this? Um, is it all right for me to do this? And we're going to address some of these things. We're going to talk about Christian liberties. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk a little bit about um, um, Christians and some um, entertainment. What type of entertainment should we as believers in this world, um, should we be entertaining? And, and we're going to talk about government. And that's a big topic right now, government, politics. How should we as believers, according to what the Bible said, how should we um, um, uh, face government? How should we interact with government and politics? We're going to be talking about some of these things because I do believe that these are some of the areas that we as believers need to understand what the Lord expects out of us on, or as, as believers um, as we live on this earth. Amen. Also, we're going to look at racism. And that's something that's a... A current topic today with so much going on, so much movement going on. We got the Black Lives Movement going on, so much happening today in our world. So we want to see what does it say biblically about racism and, and the believer. A lot of times we assume, but what does the scripture say? So we're going to spend some time looking at that. We're going to talk about work and we're going to talk about our jobs and, and, and how we should conduct ourselves ethically on our jobs and, and business dealings. How do we um, um, do business dealings, our yes and our promises and, and, and paying our bills and things of that nature. And so there's so much that we want to talk about in the upcoming weeks as we break out a brand new topic entitled How to Live in a World That is Going Wrong. And we're going to address Christian ethics as a believer. Amen. And I'm excited for that because I do think it's time now. A lot of things we can't preach um, over the pulpit because of time. A lot of time we don't have the time that we need to really put our foot on certain things. But we really want to put our foot on some of these areas. And I want you, when we do come back next week with this, um, with this topic and open up this series, I want you to have any questions. I want you to go on email. We want to hear what you have to say. We want to hear what, what's your views. Uh, what is your epistemology? What do you believe to be true as we look at the word of God? And so we want to break down some of these different things um, as we look at Christian ethics for the believer. Tonight, we're going to get started tonight, and we're going to just uh, uh, get a warm-up. We've been out for a couple of weeks. Let's get a warm-up lesson tonight, 
And it's kind of online as our conduct as Christians. And we're going to look at it from the scriptures, what God expects out of us and, 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 and how we conduct ourselves and how we can be prosperous and, and, and victorious in this life. Let's open up with a short word of prayer for Wednesday night, and then we're going to get started. Eternal God, our Father, we come to thank you and praise you and worship you, O oh God. Truly, you are God and you are God all by yourself. And we thank you, Lord God, for just loving us. Lord God, we thank you for keeping us and blessing us. And we thank you for strength of our bodies and a sound mind. We thank you, Lord God, for all the many provisions, Lord God. We thank you how, how you have become the joy of our lives, Lord God. Our, our lives are now centered around you, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. Lord God, we thank you for the fact that we know to be absent from the body means to be present with you. And we know that this earth has nothing to offer us that, that far surpasses eternal glory. So, Lord God, we thank you for the, for the assurance that you've given us of eternal life by way of your son, Jesus Christ. Now, Lord God, we pray that you would grow us up, mature us, stabilize us. Lord God, make us steadfast in the faith that we may look more and more like your son in these last and evil days. We give your name honor, praise, and glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We truly thank the Lord. We want to look at tonight. We want to open up. Just take our time, get back, and we want to share some things with you. We want to look at some practical teaching. And, and we want to look at this thing. The Apostle Paul, he does something in 1 Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul shares 21. And that's what we're going to give you tonight. We're going to give you some. We're going to do something a little different. You're going to, I want you to open up your Bible. If you're, if you're in this lesson with us tonight, I want you not just to be dependent on what's on the screen. I want you to see it for yourself. And I want you to open up your Bible. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, is going to share 21 practical Christian conduct commands to the believers. He's going to give us 21 practical Christian conduct commands. It's kind of sets us up for next week, lining us up for next week, because some of these things we're going to hear from the Apostle Paul, we're going to bring it back again, and we're going to put our foot on to get in more detail when we get into our um, um, Christian ethics. But we want to look at the Apostle Paul and what he does in the book of 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 4 and 5, contained in two chapters, are 21 commands of conduct given to the believer. Amen. A lot of times we've read 1 Thessalonians, 4th, 5th chapter, we go right over. But in 1 Thessalonians, the 4th chapter and the 5th chapter, there are 21 commands that the Apostle Paul gives to the believers. And, and if you know anything about church history, the Apostle Paul will write letters. He wrote a letter to the church at Corinth. And every time he wrote a command to them, he always had to back it up. He always had to come back and explain to them. Um, about the command. Amen. He always had to tell them and break down the command because they wanted to understand about the command. But with the church at Thessalonica, Paul, these are undefended commands. Paul gives the church at Thessalonica, the Christians in Thessalonica, he gives them command and they just run with it. And, and watch, let me say this to you. Uh, they're both saved. The church at Corinth and the church in Thessalonica saved saints born again. But sometimes how they receive commands are differently. And that's how it is as Christians. Sometimes as Christians, you got some Christians that don't receive God's commands so receivably or openly. But then you have some that receive it right away. And so as we look at this, we're going to look at 21 practical Christian conduct commands that we are to walk in. Amen. We got a lot of preachers talking about prosperity and, and blessings. Watch this. If you truly want to be blessed as a believer... If you want your family blessed, your children blessed, and if you want to be blessed in all areas of your life, this is how you get blessed, by obeying these 21 commands that we're going to share with you tonight. We're going to go right through them. We probably won't spend a lot of time in breaking them all down because you're going to see it for yourself. And these 21 commands opens up prosperity, blessings, and favor for the believer. Let me say that again. This is a formula for prosperity. There's nothing wrong with prosperity. Amen. We need prosperity as believers. There's nothing wrong with that. Success, nothing wrong with that. God wants us successful. Blessings. We all want blessings and favor for the believer. Amen. And so let's get started. We're going to look at it. What we're going to do, we're going to do a biblical exegesis. A biblical exegesis means this. It just means simply that Pastor Webster is going to extract straight from the passage. 
We're not going to add nothing to it. Amen. Watch this. With this, I don't have no supporting verses because I want to be like the Apostle Paul this evening. I want to give you the command. I want you to see the word and I want you to receive it just as it is. I shouldn't have need no supporting verses to back it up. You should be able as believers who love the Lord Jesus Christ. You should be able to, re to see it, receive it. And now start to germinate it, allow it to germinate within your heart and your mind so that now you can act upon it. All right. All right. So watch this. As we look at the I want you to turn your Bibles to First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter and the fifth chapter. And that's all we're going to stay in right there. And I want you to get a highlighter or a pen. All right. And, I, and we want to look at this and we want to I want you to uh, uh, highlight it or mark it in your Bible. Twenty one practical, practical commands christian commands practical christian conduct commands given to the believer let's start with the first one amen the first one we see is is the first one is stay paul says in in first thessalonians 4 3 we will be reading out the new king james you might have an niv it might the translation might be a little different but it's all the same it's all the same he says this for this is the will of god your sanctification that you should abstain from sexual immorality. The first practical conduct for the Christian, for the believer, for the child of God, amen, is that you stay sexually pure. That's the first thing. He says, he says that you should forsake fornication. Fornication, uh, the word is, it, you know, sexual fornication is the word we get pornography or pornea. It means to, it means to be engaged an act of fornication, that means in sexual activity outside the confines of a covenant, which is marriage. And I don't care what it is, I don't care how you shape it, any sex outside of marriage is fornication, is sexually immoral, amen? And so as we look at this, he says the first thing for the, for the believer, the first thing, and, and I want you to grab this, amen, is that you stay sexually pure, amen? You stay sexually pure. Until you put a ring on it. Amen. Amen. We don't hear that too much. Amen. But that's the kind. That's where prosperity comes in. That's where blessings come in for the child of God. When you when you when you wait on the Lord and you do it God's way, that's where the blessings come in. Amen. We're telling our um, our children now, our sons and daughters, go out and, 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 and try um, um, drink the milk before you buy the cow. Amen. That's foolishness. Amen. No, God says it's sin. To so get caught up in sexual immorality, it's sin. No, you don't do that. You wait on the Lord. Amen. So we see the first command is that you stay sexually pure. But watch the second command. We're going to go right through this. Right, it's right in the text. Watch this. In 1 Thessalonians, go right down your Bible. Go right down your Bible. Look at it. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, he says this. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourself are taught by God to love one another. And we know the church at Thessalonica, watch this, they're a powerful church. They're a powerful group of believers. Amen. They were saved, and just like, just like that, in a matter of, of time, they were saved, and they were committed to Christ. And he says the command for the conduct is that believers, watch this, are to love each other. That's it. We're to love each other. We're to agapo have a love for each other, have a sacrificial love for one another. Amen. And that's what we need more of. We need more love towards one another. He says the command, the conduct for believers is that we are to love each other, not just your family. Amen. We're to love other believers. And he says I you to do that even more, even though you're doing it, do it even more. And in the time that we're living in right now, we need to love each other even more. Amen. In the midst of all that's going on in the world, believers, watch this. We need to love each other even more. We need to come together and love each other even more. Amen. So the second thing we see of conduct for the believer is that we love each other. Isn't that awesome? That's an awesome thing. That brings prosperity. That brings success. That's a formula. And it brings blessings. We're running right through this. Watch this. And then the third thing. Look what he says. The third thing. The third thing, and these are kind of uh, 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 with no, no defense. We don't need to defend these. We don't need to say, but, but, but. No, there's no but. He says, do it. Put it into action. It's one thing knowing scriptures. It's another thing acting upon the word of God. Amen? The third thing that he says is, and it's important. He says that we are to live, that should be live a quiet life. We are to live a quiet life. Amen? We are to live a quiet life. Watch what he says here. 
he says this, he says this, he says that you, watch this, in this verse, in this verse, he gives us three commands in one verse. There are three conduct commands in the exegesis in one verse. He said the first thing is, watch this thirdly, we are to live a quiet life. Look what he says, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life. That's what he says. He says that the believer should be living a life that, that our life should be without controversy. We shouldn't be in the midst of, of, of scandals. Believers in Jesus Christ that represent Jesus Christ, we shouldn't be caught up in scandals and troubles and things of, of that nature. Amen. We shouldn't be caught up in things that are negative. Amen. Things that, things that can mar the name of Christ. He says as a believer, watch this, lead a quiet life. Live a quiet life. Your life should be a quiet life. That don't mean you don't make an impact in the world. That don't mean that you're passive or that you're a doormat. It just means that your life is blameless. That when the outside world tries to accuse you, they can't accuse you. They can lie on you, but they can't accuse you. And the believers call to live a quiet life. Don't get your name caught up in controversy with you in the newspaper, on the news for crazy stuff. No, no, no. We're supposed to represent the kingdom. Amen. And so he says that we are to lead a quiet life. But watch this. In one verse, he gives us three commands. And the second command he gives us is the fourth thing. Watch this. And we say this all the time. Mind your own business. That's a favorite verse. First lady, she loves this verse. Amen. She loves with this verse. This is one of her favorite verses. Amen. Mind your own business. Look what he says in here. Now he says you are to lead a quiet life. The second command in this is to mind your own business. Focus on yourself. That's what Paul is saying. Focus on yourself. Don't be a busybody. Stop trying to be in everybody else's business. Stop trying to tell everybody else what to do. Amen. We live in a day and age. Everybody got an answer. Everybody want to tell somebody else what to do. Mind your own business. Amen. Take care of your family. Amen. Take care of what you got going on. Amen. That's what he says in there. Did you see that? Look at the text. Did you see that? He says, stop trying to investigate someone else's life. Stop trying to investigate someone else's family. Amen? You can't investigate my family because you don't know my family. You think you know my family. I don't know your family. Amen? Stop trying to investigate other people's families and, and other people's lives. And you make sure that you keep your life. You examine your own life. Isn't that a great truth? That's a great truth for prosperity and blessings is that we mind our own business. Lord, have mercy. That's a work right there within itself. In the world of gossip and in the world of, of all we want stuff going on. And then thirdly, he says this in that text. It's really, it's the, it's the, it's the, um, the uh, fifth thing that he says in that text. He says, and work with your, with your hands. Work with your hands. And what he means by that, the Apostle Paul, don't forget, he was dealing with the church at Thessalonica, and they were waiting, they were waiting, they were waiting for the return of Christ, but they were being idle. And he is saying, no, you, he says in another passage of scripture in, in, in the book of Thessalonians, he says, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's what he says, a man that don't work, don't eat. And so what he is saying here is that you are to earn your money. Earn your own money. How have you earned it? You may not make six figures. You, you may not even make five. I don't know. But he says, earn your own money. Pay your own bills. Don't be a burden to nobody else. At least put forth the effort. Amen. Not that we don't need help at times. Not that we don't need somebody to come. But, but watch this. Put it on your back. Amen. Put it on your back. Amen. Put it on your back and pay your bills and, and, and stay on top of your stuff. Amen. Pay your debt. Amen. Don't be an un unnecessary burden. And so he says this, you work with your hands. Look, I don't mind blessing nobody that don't mind working, that don't mind putting it on their back. Amen. I don't mind blessing. I don't mind being there for nobody that don't mind putting forth an effort to take care of themselves. So we see here that he says and, and one scripture, one scripture, he gives three different conduct commands. Lead a quiet life. Your life should be a quiet life. He says, mind your own business and work with your hands. Isn't that some good stuff? If we would just put these into practice as believers, I man, our life would be so prosperous, so successful. Amen. And there would be so many blessings that rain down from glory. Amen. But then he goes on. Watch in the text. In the text. Is everything is in the text. It's in the exegesis of the text. Amen. No supporting verses because you're just like the church at Thessalonica. You don't need me to defend what God is saying. If God says it, we don't need no more defense for it. 
Look what he says. The sixth thing, recognize and respect your spiritual leaders. Amen. Look what he says in 1 Thessalonians 5.12. He says, and we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Watch this. He says, those who are your spiritual leaders, you should have respect and you should honor them. Amen. That's what he says. He ain't talking about your boss on the job. He's talking about those who are over you spiritually, those who feed you, those who build into your life, those who, who build eternity into your life, those who are getting you fit and ready for glory. He said that you are to regard them and you are to recognize them and you are to respect them. Amen. That's what, that's what the Hebrew writer says in 13, and the Hebrews 13, he says, obey your leaders. That means to fall under their leadership. And you follow them as they follow Christ, amen? You follow them as they follow Christ. And he also says, you can follow their example. That means that the leader should set an example, amen? And if the leader sets an example, you should be able to follow that leader's example of godliness and righteousness. Don't mean that the leader's perfect. But it means that he loved or she loved the Lord and you ought to follow their leadership. Amen. And we're living in a day and now so much rebellion, even in the church. There's rebellion in the church. You got folks in the church that can't even put two scriptures together, but they want to tell spiritual leadership how to lead a church. No, you learn how to fall under spiritual leadership and that's how the Lord bless you. Don't be like, don't be like Cora. Don't be like Cora. Amen. We just, we just as good as you. Yeah, you are, but you're not the one that God has called. Amen. You're not the one that God has called for leadership. Amen. And so as we look at this, we got to recognize and respect spiritual leadership. Let that sink in because we're in a day of more rebellion. It's trying to even creep in the New Testament church. Amen. I got to get that out. Amen. Amen. If you can't follow the leadership at your church, you need to find you another church. Amen. You need to find you another place to, uh, to fellowship or worship. Amen. And then he says this. He says the next thing, the seventh thing. Watch this. We're going right through these because I want you to see them for yourself. Can you, can you see it? You got your Bible open? Look at it for yourself. Amen. It may read a little bit different than your NIV, but it's the same thing. Look what it says. And it says, be at peace among ourselves. Look at the seventh thing he says. And, and 1 Thessalonians 5.13, he says, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work and be at peace among yourself. He comes off the back end about spiritual leaders, that you are to esteem them highly, amen? They're not God, amen? You don't put them on a pedestal with the Lord, but you are to respect them. But then he says this, be at peace amongst yourself. Saying that believers, watch this, there shouldn't be no strife, no craziness, no wickedness amongst us. We should have a, a level of peace. There should be peace amongst believers, amen? And if there's ever a disruption of peace, we need to be the ones that go seek peace. We need to humble ourselves and seek peace. That's what the devil wants. He wants for the church, he wants for God's people not to operate and have peace among themselves. But he said that we ought to have peace among ourselves. Amen? Isn't that some great stuff? This is the conduct. This is the Christian conduct that God has commanded. I know we see these sitcoms. Uh, the church is all crazy. Um, people talk about the church. Uh, 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 the deacons all messed up. The pastors all messed up. People fighting in the church. But that's not God's model. God's model is, is, is a Christ model. And Christ's model is that there should be peace in his church. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Watch this. And so we're, we've seen the seventh Christian conduct. Isn't some good stuff? I'm grabbing this stuff myself. I want to make sure I operate in this stuff. Watch this. And then the eighth Christian conduct. We're going to give you 21 in two chapters. Be at peace among ourselves, right? Now we exhort you, brethren, amen, that we ought to be at peace among ourselves. And here we go. Watch this. Uh, and he says this. I'm sorry. He says this in verse 14. I'm sorry. At verse 14, he says this. He says in verse 14, I don't know if it's on your screen. Hopefully it's on your screen. If it's not, write this down. If it's a misprint, if it's a misprint, please write it down. Verse 14, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, he says, Now we exhort you, brethren, watch this, to warn those who are unruly, comfort the fainthearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. Amen? Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. This is it right here. Watch this. The first thing that we see is this. He says this. He says that we are to confront the unruly. Or, the, or those who are idle. That's how it should read, amen? We are to confront those 
who are unruly. Now you say, this is church. That ain't my business. No, that is your business. Amen. As believers, we are to confront those who are unruly. And you got to understand what Paul means with this. What Paul means with this is this. When he says those who are unruly, he means those who are idle. Those, in, in, in the NIV, he says those who are idle or, or, or warn those who are idle. In the King James or, or the New King James, he says unruly. He's talking about those who are undisciplined in the body. He's talking about those who are out of character. He's talking about those who are in the church, born again believers, but they're out of step with the things of God. Amen. They're not disciplined in their lives. Amen. And he says, watch this. He says, he says that as believers, what are we supposed to do? Watch this. He says that we are to warn them or to confront them. Amen. I know we don't want to say this kind of stuff in church, but we are. We are to confront those who are out of line, those who are undisciplined. Those who are saying one thing but living another way. Those who are idle and not and, and, and damaging the cause of Christ. Amen. Those who cause problems and division to cause a, a disruption in the cause of Christ. Let me say that again. And so he says that we are to warn them. We are to warn them. We are to confront them. Amen. A lot of times we don't want that. Because we think everything is supposed to be peachy keen, but sometimes it comes with that. Amen. But then he says this, watch this. Not only that, but he says there's a second thing in the ninth thing. He says to comfort those who are faint hearted. Remember, the eighth one it might be a little misprint on the screen, but it should, be, it, should be, it should be to confront or to warn those who are unruly or idle. But then watch this. The ninth thing is to confront the faint hearted. Amen. Or to comfort, I should say, the faint-hearted. And the faint-hearted, when he says comfort the faint-hearted, uh, uh, those who are timid. Don't you know we got people in the body of Christ that are faint-hearted? Amen? And it's not, a, it's not, watch this, it's not a bad thing because there's people with different, at different levels of growth. People at different levels, amen, of growth in different seasons. And you got some folks that are timid. Amen? Uh, Paul was encouraging Timothy, one of his great preachers, but he was timid. Amen? And so Paul says here, he says, those who may be timid, those who may be faint hearted, folks who, 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 who are afraid. Amen. And, and we do. And, and the body says we're all connected. We got folks sometimes that are just afraid. They may be afraid to step out in the deep, afraid to trust the Lord or afraid what life is bringing them. And he says, as believers, watch this. Our Christian conduct is not to tear them down, but we are to comfort them. Watch this. We're to comfort them. Amen. Because it may be areas that, that, they're, that they're weak in and there's areas that we're, they're, we're strong in or vice versa. But he says as believers, we are to comfort those who are faint hearted, those who are timid, those who are afraid. Amen. And every once in a while, even in this season, um, people get afraid. And, and for those who aren't afraid, well, God bless you. Go find somebody in the body that you can that you can comfort. Go find somebody that you can encourage. Maybe someone needs to hear your encouragement on a daily basis. Amen. But he says that you ought to do that. That's our Christian conduct. Amen. But not only that, he says, and uphold the weak. Look at the three Christian conducts he gives us in one verse. Uh, uh, in verse 14, he gives us three conduct commands. Confront the unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, and uphold the weak. And you say, who are the weak? Folks who are weak in their faith. Watch this back to what I was saying. Everybody's at different seasons in their walk. And everybody wants to be strong. Everybody wants to put up a, a, a front that I'm strong in all areas, but I stop by and let you know, nobody is strong in all areas. And so there's areas in our lives that our faith is weak. And so for those who are strong in those areas, we are to what? We are to help those whose faith is weak. Those who may be weak in faith in certain areas in their life. So we see in here, it's ties in the Christian love. This is the conduct of believers. We don't slam them. We don't talk about them. We don't ridicule them. But what do we do? Paul says you help them. He says you help those who are weak. Amen? You help those. He ain't dealing with no sin here. No, we, we're dealing with somebody who is legitimately, spiritually weak in some areas in their life. Isn't that some good stuff? We're talking about how do we become successful. How do we become prosperous? Everybody thinking about dollar bills. But being prosperous is not about Oh, it's about money. Amen. It's about your soul. It's about it's about where God is taking you and what he's doing in your life. Amen. Here we go. So we shared three things. Amen. Comfort the faint hearted, help the weak and confront 
the unruly. Everybody got that? Everybody got that? We, we hitting some stuff. We're dealing with Christian conduct. Amen? Some good stuff here. Some good stuff for the believer, how we are to conduct ourselves. Now watch this. That's what the world needs to see. Though outside, outside the walls of this church, the world needs to see us operating like this. Then we won't be made fun of on sitcoms and, 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 and YouTube and jokes and stuff like that. When they see us actually operating the way that the Apostle Paul gives us this command straight from God's word, how we are to conduct ourselves as believers. Isn't that some good stuff? 21 commands. Let's, let's finish it out. And then watch this. Here we go. We go into, we go into the next command. Watch this. And, he, and we get into the next command and he gets down here. The fourth command he says, be patient with all. Look at this. So we're looking at four, I'm sorry, four, four different commands. He says, uh, confront the unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. I'm sorry, four commands. Four Christian conduct commands in one verse. Did you see that? Now we exhort you, brother, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. Watch those unde uh, undefended commands. We got to learn how to be patient. All of us. Pastor Webb learned how to be patient. I got to learn how to be patient in this season. Got to be patient with people. Everybody's not where everybody, um, uh, where, where I might think everybody should be or, or where they may think they should be. We got to learn how to be patient. We got to learn how to be patient. Everybody's situation is different. Am I right about that? And watch this. You have to learn how to be patient. As Christians, we got to learn how to be patient with all. We got to be patient. We got to learn how to be patient. Amen? And, and, and it's through trials and tribulation, watch this, according to James, that God creates this patience within us. It's through, it's, it's through testing of trials and tribulation that we learn how to persevere and become patient. Learn how to wait on the Lord. Learn how to be patient with people. Amen? And so he says in these four commands let me go back over them real quick because i want you to see him he says confront or or um, um, um confront the unruly all right or maybe it says uh, uh 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 to to warn the idle warn those who are idle right then he says comfort the faint-hearted help the weak and be patient with everyone that's bible this bible right here amen you can't get no deeper than this this is this is didactic Bible teaching right here. Amen. This is, this is what the Lord is looking for in each one of us right now. Amen. And then we come into the 12th, the 12th one. Watch this. And this is a big one. This is the one that I lived on when I gave my life to Jesus Christ uh, years ago, almost over 31 years ago, um, when the Lord saved me, he, when he delivered me, this is the scripture that I had to hold on to. This is the one that delivered me. Amen. Because of the lifestyle and all that I was in. And this is the scripture that kept me. Don't do evil for evil. Don't do wrong for wrong. And that's a constant discipline. That's a constant discipline for the child of God not to do wrong for wrong. Because they did me wrong, because they did me evil, because they said something against me, I got to say something against them. I got to retaliate. Amen? And he says, no, no, that's not Christian conduct. Christian conduct don't do evil for evil. See that no one renders evil to evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for both for both for yourselves and for all. Amen. So watch this. He says, don't do evil for evil. Did you see that? But not only that, it's two parts to this. He said, we shouldn't do evil for evil. There's two commands out of verse 15. Don't do evil for evil. Amen. Catch this. Don't, don't do evil for evil. That is, that's even uh, talking about the unsaved. That means save even with the saved or the unsaved. You don't do evil for evil. You let the Lord judge. You let the Lord be the one. It's some stuff that, watch this, that God going to deal with. I ain't got to say a word. Amen? I ain't got to deal with it. God deals with it. You know why? Because he sees it all. Amen? He's the righteous judge. Amen? And you let the Lord handle that. Judgment belongs to the Lord. Amen? And so as we look at this, he says, don't do evil for evil. And that, and, and that same verse, the second, which is uh, 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 13, he says this. He says this, and pursue what is good for both you and everybody else. Did you get that? These are all commands of conduct. Don't do evil for evil. That's one conduct. All right, let that stuff go. Let the Lord fight it. Let the Lord do it, right? Let the Lord fight your battle. But then the other thing is this. You do what is good. You do, you do what is good for both you 
and everybody else. Isn't that something? We're living in a day and age now, and even in the midst of this pandemic. You know what the key word now is being responsible. Because now, watch this, if you do what this says, you do what's good for you and everybody else, you'll safeguard your life. Because you're thinking about other people. You're thinking about, watch this, not infecting other people or, 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 or anything like that. So you're now safeguarding what you do. So that, watch this, that you will also be safeguarding other people. And he says, as believers, we're to do what's good for, for us, what's good for me, but what's also good for somebody else. That's Christian. That's being a child of God. That's being a born-again believer when you're thinking about other people and you're not being selfish, you're just thinking about yourself. Oh, my goodness. I could preach that right there. So we see this, 1 Thessalonians 5.15. He gives us that. He gives us two commands with that. Isn't that some good stuff? But then he comes down and he gives us the 14th. We only got 21. That's all we're going to do is 21. He gives us the 14th. And the 14th is this, uh, we've heard this always. He says the command for us is to rejoice always. Always rejoice. Always rejoice in the Lord. No matter what, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice always, no matter what. No matter, I don't care if you're sick and can't get well. I don't care if your, your money's funny. You got to learn how to make your boast in the Lord. You got to command your soul to rejoice in Jesus. Because he's been good to us. And he's always opened up doors for us and he's still keeping us. Amen. And we have to command our souls to do that. He says to rejoice. A command is that we rejoice always in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what he expects. He re expects the believer to worship him by always rejoicing in him. No matter what your earthly circumstance is, we are to rejoice in the Lord. That's a command. That brings prosperity. That brings blessings. Amen. That brings favor from God when you and I learn how to rejoice in the Lord always. It's something when I see the older saints, no matter what they're going through, I, I, I touch bases over this last seven, eight months with a lot of older saints, and no matter what they're going through, amen, they still rejoice in the Lord. I talked to Sister Jennifer, amen, one of our oldest saints, Sister, Sister Richardson, Sister Richardson and Sister Jennifer, Emma um, Richardson and Sister Jennifer, they're the same age. Uh, Gary turned 91, both of them this year. And when I talked to them, guess what? They're rejoicing in the Lord. They're doing better than some 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds. Amen. They're rejoicing in the Lord. So the command is to rejoice always. And then watch this. In 17, watch the 15th command of conduct and pray without ceasing. That means you and I should be perpetually praying all the time. Amen. As we're walking in the way, praying means to meditate. Praying always without ceasing to mean to keep our minds on things above. To keep our minds on. It shouldn't be days that go by that you ain't got your mind in heaven. Shouldn't be days that go by that you don't think about Jesus Christ and this great salvation he has given us. We should constantly be praying, ceasing, while praying without ceasing, meaning that our mind stays on the goodness of the Lord, our mind stays on Jesus Christ and all the great things he's done for us by way of not just materialistic things, but spiritual things. So he says that we ought to keep praying without ceasing. Praying without ceasing. That's a command. That's a command for all believers. Amen. That's a command for all believers. And then as we come down, here we go. We're tracking our way down. He says this. He says, and then the 16th thing, the 16th command. Here we go. Give thanks in everything. In everything, give thanks for this, the will of God. We just preached this a couple weeks ago. The will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you he said we're to give thanks amen amen ain't nothing like a thankful saint you know it, sometimes i just catch myself saying thank you lord just thank you just out of nowhere amen just thanking the lord just thanking him amen thanking him no matter what just thanking the lord because guess what it didn't have to be like this guess what i could still be dead in my sins and my trespasses amen Guess what? I could be on my way to a burn in hell. And if nothing else, I thank the Lord as Psalms 103 says, for all of his benefits. All of his benefits. How he lifted us up out of the pit. Amen. Delivered us. And so we are to always be thankful. Watch this. In everything. That's an indicative command that don't need no defense. That we are to be thankful. Isn't that some good stuff? Amen. We're learning Christian kind of before we even get into Christian ethics. Because we're going to get deep. I'm starting next week when we look at Christian ethics. And then 17th, do not quench the spirit. 
do not quench the spirit. That's what he says. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, um, 19, he says, do not, look at the command. Do not, do not quench the spirit. What do you mean by that, Paul? Amen. Don't put out the spirit's flame. As the spirit is leading you, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you, to speak to you, to direct you, to instruct you. Amen. Don't put out the, don't put out the flame of the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't douse out the, uh, extinguish the flame of the Holy Spirit as he's moving in your life. We got some, we got some Christians so, so stiff that the Holy Spirit can't even break through. You got to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you. You don't, you don't quench the Spirit. And we know that sin can quench the Spirit. But we also know rebellion can quench the Spirit of not wanting to be led by the Spirit of God. Listen to every voice. You want to be led by people and everything else. Amen. But you got to be led by the Spirit of God. Amen. So we see that. And then he says here, watch this. And in, in, in 18 thing, do not despise. Look, do not despise prophecy. Hear that command. Meaning that when the word of God is speaking, don't reject it. Amen. Stop only picking and choosing what you want to hear. Good, good word, good sermons or, or a certain type of preaching. No, when the word of God is preached, when the word of God is taught, when, the, when you read the word of God, don't reject what the word of God is saying. Watch this. Not to your neighbor, not to your wife, not to your husband. What is the word of God saying to you? And that's when you're starting to despise prophecy. Amen. You're starting to pick and choose what you want to listen to, what you don't want to listen to. But you got to take the word of God in its entirety. And he says that the command for the Christian is do not despise prophecy. Did you get that today? We almost done. We're getting some commands here. That means when the word stop, when the word falls on you, allow it to rest on you. Allow it to speak to you because it's God's inerrant word. Amen. But then 19th, the 19th conduct. It says test all things. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. It says that we are to test all things. What do you mean? Amen. Don't fall for anything. That's what it means. It means allow the spirit to give you discernment. And you test it against the word of God. You stop listening to all this talk. Everybody talking about this and that. You, 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 you try the spirit by the spirit. Does it line up with the, what the word of God says? Amen. Does it line up in the spirit of Christ? Amen. Does it come with love? Does it come with all these things that come from the word of God? And it says that you are to test it. You are to test all things. I test all things. I discern. I listen to voices. I, I discern all these things. And so you as a believer, you got to learn how to detest, test all things. Because someone said they're a child of God. Watch this. If they're living like a box of yakimi, amen, living like, living like hell, never even talk about Jesus, but they're going to tell you they're a child of God. I want to tell you about some things about church. Man, you need to learn how to test everything. You need to learn how to test and stop being so gullible and fall and pray to every little thing that comes your way. So it says, test all things and hold fast to what is good. We're almost finished. Watch this. And then we come down to the 20th. And then it says in that, hold fast to what is good. I'm sorry. It gives us two. It says, and hold fast. In that one scripture, in verse 21, it says, hold fast to what is good. Whatever is good, that's what you hold fast to. If it's good, you stick with it. If it's working, it's good, and it pleases the Lord, you stick with it. If it honors God, you stick with it. Amen. Don't let nobody turn you away from what is good. Do what is good. He says, if you do what is right, uh, 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 God told um, 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 Cain, he said, Cain, if you just do what is right, won't I do this? If you just do what is right, no good thing will I withhold from him who walks upright according to the Psalms. Amen. And so it's just do what is good. And then the last one, 20, the 21st uh, uh, conduct, Christian conduct. It says here, it says that in the last one, it says, abstain from every form of evil. That should be the last one. Amen. I don't know if it's on top of you. It may not be on top, but it should be abstain. That may be a misprint. Test all things where he did that. But abstain, just write that in. Abstain, abstain from every form of evil. If it's evil, if it looks like it's evil, if it perceives to be evil, Amen. You abstain. You get away from it. 
Amen. If it doesn't bring honor and glory to God, you get away from it. It says abstain from every form, from every appearance of evil. It, some things that might not be even, even looks like it's a little evil. It could be suspect. Or someone can lock you into it because you're around it. It says you, you abstain from it. You get away from anything that could even be connected with evils. What did I get, just give you tonight? I just gave you 21 undefended commands for the believer. Rooted, this is what the outside world should see from the saved church. Isn't that some good stuff? I just gave it to you out of the scriptures. Amen. Out of the scriptures, what the outside world should see from the saved church. Isn't that some good stuff? We're going to come back next week. We're going to start this great series. You got to be... Get somebody, grab some, call somebody, tell them to get online because we're going to deal, we're gonna deal with, we're going to deal with entertainment. We're going to deal with the dress. We're going to deal with politics. We're going to deal with all kinds of stuff. We're going to deal with racism. Amen. And we're going we're gonna to deal with color. Amen. You stick around. We're going to show you where color comes from and, and the different cultures and stuff. We're going to deal with all these different ethical things that we as believers always want to know that we can grow up and say we can learn how to be light and salt on the earth. You want to represent Jesus Christ well on the earth. May God bless you. Watch this. There may be someone here tonight. Tonight is the night that you want to give your life to Jesus. Call upon his name. He saved the world. He came into the world to redeem that which is lost. He didn't come into the world to give you a Cadillac, to give you a house on the hill, to make you rich. No. He came into the world so he could deliver your soul from a burning hell. That's why Jesus came. And all you got to do is call upon his name. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And today is the day of salvation. If you're here, if you're on, um, online and you're watching this and you say, Lord, save me right now. I know that I'm lost. I know that I'm a sinner and I accept you as a savior. And I ask for you to forgive my sins and I repent of my sin. I turn from my way and I turn to you. Lord, be Lord of my life. Today is the day of salvation. Don't let this moment pass you by. Because you, tomorrow is never promised. Today is the day of salvation. Accept the Lord. And if you did accept the Lord, amen, we want to thank the Lord. I tell you what, you can email me. Send on the email to today I accept the Lord. We'll put your name and number on there, whatever you want to do, and we'll contact you. If there's any questions about anything that we discuss today, please go on the email. Let's talk about it. Let's discuss it. Because I know when we come back next week, we've got a lot of things to talk about. I want to see you next week. If the Lord says so, if Christ has not cracked the sky, amen, we're going to be here next week. Or unless he calls one of us home to be with him. Other than that, our, our, our aim is to be here next week so we can get ready for living in a world. How to live in a world that has gone wrong. Amen. We're going to learn that. And we're going to grow up and learn about Christian ethics. Christian ethics. For believers. May God bless you. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Get raised communion Sunday for Rooted Bible. So I expect to see all the Rooted members. Call somebody up. Let them know. Look, girl. Look, man. Get on. Get on service because we got communion on Sunday. Let's still be the church. Even in the midst of what's going on. Watch this. We are still the church that represents Jesus Christ because he's the head of the church. May God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Be safe. Be wise. Amen. And safeguard your life. Look forward to talking to you again soon. Be blessed.